afternoon, everyone. I'll just uh, fix my mic to make sure um, it doesn't fall off. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about transportation, but um, working at Siemens, it's probably just worth saying that, that we cover multiple sectors, so energy, healthcare, manufacturing, and urban mobility is a significant part of our business. And what we're um, particularly interested in, the work that I'm doing in urban development, is speaking to cities around how transportation infrastructure really will impact their future. So we talked to them about the latest advances in technology and particularly how digitalization and um, if you like smart technology or intelligent infrastructure can help them with some of these challenges that they have. But um, before we look to the future, if we just sort of reflect and um, look back, and I'm not sure where I should be pointing the clicker, uh, doesn't seem to be responding. Okay, uh, clicking forward, yeah, no, unless we try, oh, there we go, very good, I think I've got some assistance there. Um, so, looking back, if we think about what urban mobility was about, it's really about moving people from A to B, about giving people a little bit more um, independence to go where, where they want and how they want, perhaps offering a little bit more comfort. But as things progressed and technology moved on, um, what we find is far more road users now, people with um, different needs from the roads and different demands. And so then there was the introduction of freight on our roads. So moving goods and uh, products from, from A to B, city to city, but also country to country. And this started putting a lot more pressure on, on our services and on our infrastructure. And with the evolution of motorization, we saw a further change. So roads became our urban arteries. Um, huge demand, huge over demand, and excessive uh, traffic began to uh, find its way onto our roads. But the impacts that came with that were something that cities weren't prepared for. And still today, we see problems with the impacts of urban transportation. So then there was the move into public transportation. This was about mass transit, getting people from A to B more quickly. But much more of them at any one point in time. And as you can see there, public transportation and train journeys in India are hugely popular. Um, but also in Mongolia, the, the new school bus opportunities were uh, significant. But as with every market, there are advances in, in technologies and how we deliver services and new experiences. And when we're speaking to our cities today or our customers, it's really all about that experience for, for the user and for the passenger and what they need from their transportation. And as cities are trying to develop that in their thinking, they're also wondering how they're going to tackle some of the impacts. And then, of course, we see people developing new forms of technology. So we hear a lot about hybrid technology, diesel electric, um, or, or various forms of hydrogen uh, as well. As we see that on uh, London's buses. And so people are beginning to think about how we integrate these different technologies. But no matter where we look, to, what we see today is this, that demand is significantly outweighing supply or capacity capacity on the system. And it may, it may seem that actually these problems maybe are more significant in places like Delhi and, and so on, but actually there was a report released this week by INRIX. Um, they have looked at 100 cities around the world, and the city that came out on top of the, the congestion rankings was London. And they found that people were spending 101 hours in traffic congestion in the city every year. It's the first time a city has topped 100 hours. So even here at home, we're faced with some of these really um, significant problems. And so this is a scene you might be familiar with. Um, seen it on the news quite a lot over the last couple of years. This is Beijing. And so while this growth and these advances are great, actually what we get is this over-demand that leads to significant problems. And there's so many impacts now that come as a result of this. And if we begin to put those impacts in, into numbers for London, what does that mean? Well, you see the extent of it here. 10 million journeys every day are made in the car, and that's 42% of all journeys in the city. 3.5 million by bus, 6 million people walking and cycling. 88% of London's freight is moved by road. And that is significant when you think about last mile deliveries coming right into the city, coming to people's homes as there's this move to online shopping, online retail. What that really means for our roads and uh, our cities is quite significant. 
Also, 67% um, of emissions are from transport in the city, and as you're probably all familiar with, um, the EU has significant limits around air quality, and London does find itself being fined by the EU for exceeding these uh, air quality uh, regulations. And the extent of the problem, well, TfL are man managing 700 bus routes on our roads today, then that's a huge and complex problem that they're tackling. But actually, if you look more deeply into some of these figures, what we find is really quite shocking. So road injuries are the eighth leading cause of death. Uh, the number one killer of people between 15 and 25 are also road accidents. Over 50% of deaths are from people walking or cycling on our streets. And you can see there how these figures are growing and growing. And also then there's this issue about what this means for the economy. So the more time spent in traffic, the less productive we are, and there's a significant loss to London's economy every year. And we're seeing this factoring into the decisions that we're making around how we change transport. And as a globally competitive city, of course, this is something that London needs to tackle. You may have been aware, I think it was last week, um, that the uh, notice came around that we shouldn't be using Victoria Station between 8 and 9 in the morning, one of the busiest stations in London. But because of the demand and the capacity and the overcrowding, people are being encouraged not to use it. And for the Mayor of London, this is something he's going to really have to be thinking about because the population growth in London is going to be over 1 million in the next uh, 15 years. So this is only going to become more and more difficult. So what are we looking at now? Well, you'll hear a lot of talk about autonomous vehicles. You may have heard some talk of this in the last couple of days. And on the uh, left-hand side there, these are the, um, the pods at Heathrow Airport. These, these were um, Siemens pods. This is driverless technology. We've been using it for a while now, moving people between terminals and um, the car parks. And then on the right-hand side, you might be familiar with the autonomous vehicle trials in Milton Keynes, also happening in Greenwich, in Bristol and Coventry. There's a huge amount of government money going into looking at what these autonomous vehicles will, will look like on the roads, how people will use them, and the impacts that they have on the wider urban environment. But what's really interesting, when you speak to some people today, they're saying that actually their children now are talking about not bothering with a driving test because when the autonomous vehicles come, they won't need to worry about that. They'll be doing other things whilst they're in the car and the car will be taking control, taking them where they want to go. And also there's this move away from car ownership. We've seen it in London for a while simply because of the congestion, but we're seeing more and more of a move to people saying, well, actually, we're not going to need a, a car in future, certainly not one of our own. And there's this move to carpooling, car sharing which is not necessarily going to work for everyone, depending on where you live, but um, certainly we're seeing changes in attitudes for, for the users on the roads. And for those of you that do drive, you'll be aware there's many features in the car today that are already heading in that direction of autonomous vehicles. Our cars can park for us. They'll tell us when we're too close to a vehicle in front or behind. They'll tell us if they think we're sleeping at the wheel. So these technologies have been tested for quite some time now. And all this data has been gathered and been understood by the automotive industry. But what we're quite interested in is the transition between where we are today and getting to full autonomy. And what we believe when we speak to the uh, automotive industry, what they're saying is there will be choice. They, there has to be some choice. There are all different kind of road users for a start. You've got uh, pedestrians, you've got people on bikes, but you've also got people who will want to drive. And unless that's really controlled within our urban centers, you're going to have a mixture of users on the road. Some who will be in autonomous vehicles and others who won't. So something that we're working on at Siemens, it's, it's quite uh, close to our hearts. We, we run um, over 80% of the, the highway infrastructure in the UK and a significant proportion of traffic lights and traffic management systems. And what we need to be thinking about, how these cars are communicating with one another, with the people in the cars, and also with the other uh, traffic on the road and the infrastructure in the roads. So we have um, been developing something we call vehicle to X technology or vehicle to anything technology. And the idea re here really is these autonomous vehicles will be able to communicate with the traffic lights and with the other urban infrastructure to let them know where, where they're coming from, what speed they're traveling at, and also to be informed about what else is on the road. 
So this technology, um, what we eventually see, what the bigger picture will be, is that all transportation forms will be connected such that we understand how buses, trains and cars can all interact together. When people flood out of uh, the train station at any given point in time, how does that then affect the traffic lights? So the traffic lights knows there's a huge amount of pedestrians coming. They can then prioritise pedestrian access to, to the roads. So, um, there we go. Uh, what we're seeing now is a move towards in-car communication so that you will get this information directly into the car, which will give you further information about what's happening around you. So, in an autonomous car, semi-autonomous car, what you can get perhaps are things like hazard warnings, indications that the ambulance might be coming. It might be a couple of miles behind you. You might not see the blue light. You might not hear it yet but you'll be informed that this is coming because the ambulance itself will be tagged with this technology. So cars can begin to get out of the, the way of the, the upcoming blue light services. Um, it may be that what we can do, and we're doing this in some places already, is give prioritization to public transportation. So the traffic lights know the, the buses are coming and they can uh, have the green light to keep the public transportation moving. And intersection assistance. So this will be if you're a car user, perhaps, and um, the traffic lights are currently at red, you will get notification to tell you what speed you should be traveling at to ensure that you don't have to stop at the traffic lights. And if everyone slows down, the traffic will then keep moving. It will prevent idling at the traffic lights and the intersections, which reduces emissions, reduces congestion, and the whole system can keep moving more, more smoothly. And then, of course, there's um, the ability to integrate city information. So something else we look at is smart parking solutions. So around 30% of cars on the roads in our urban centres are looking for a parking space. So that's quite a significant amount of people. And if we can divert these people, stop them circling the city, looking for available parking, and inform them in the car directly where the parking is available, then we can reduce that, that circling significantly and reduce the emissions and congestions that goes with that. So we have a radar-based solution which we can integrate into buildings, which not only can identify where the available parking is, it can identify anyone in a bus route that shouldn't be there, any other violations in parking spaces where people shouldn't be parking. And where we've been trialling this, what cities have found is that they're um, losing a huge amount of money in parking violations and people are not paying for the parking. So this facility gives to the minute billing capability. So the city will understand where the greatest demand is. They can then plan their cities and their streets better, knowing where the demand is in the city. And also they can take street furniture away because there's the capability to pay for your parking through your mobile device. So... The way that we're seeing this technology going is that the infrastructure can help the driver move around the city more effectively. What this might look like in the car, and I will just point out that these um, are in kilometres per hour, not miles per hour. So if you're moving through the urban centre and your GPS is telling you that the speed limit is 50 kilometres an hour today, what we'll hope to see in the, in the future is that it will tell you what speed you should be driving at to ensure that you get the green wave on the traffic lights. Similarly, on the highway, your GPS will typically tell you what the national speed limit is or what speed limits are, are being put on the roads. But if there's an accident, that information isn't fed in real time through into your, your car uh, dashboard. So this technology will enable you to find out where the accidents are, how far up the motorway they are. Even if there's a bend in the road and you can't currently see them, it will tell you that in a certain distance from now there will be an accident, so you should start slowing down. And so we've started trialling the vehicle to X technology on the highways in Germany and we're seeing significant results. And this is just with certain vehicles on the road being tagged with this technology. Significant reduction, over 35% fewer accidents, over 30% fewer injuries on the roads, which has um, an amazing uh, impact really, not just on the drivers, but on the city, on, on the emergency services. It takes so much of the pain out of driving. 
So that was all the, the reasons why Siemens really gets involved in this. Our raison d'etre really is to help the infrastructure um, move us around cities, to provide us with the power and the facilities that we need. But what we're also finding as we move towards electrification and automated vehicles, that the automotive industry are approaching us now because they want to offer a very different experience to car users in the future. Not only do they see the move to autonomy being something cities are interested in and the need to convert our surrounding infrastructure but they want to offer that more interesting experience to, to drivers as well. So there's this huge movement towards infotainment in the car and what they are talking to us about is how can they use that capability perhaps to help further advance some of the capabilities of the car on the road. So they're looking at things like sensors and steering wheels which will be able to identify some of your health indicators and so therefore if you're stressed out perhaps the music might change or there might be something changes in the car to create a more relaxing or calming environment. But also heartbeat sensors and which can detect things like sudden onset of illness and if that's perhaps um, a heart rate increase then there's the capability that the car can be rerouted towards the hospitals or the emergency services. So there's a huge amount of change coming in, in the car sector, a huge amount of different opinion uh, you'll, you'll probably be aware of in, in the press and in the media. But like with everything else, the smart cities with the data revolution, the automated car, the connected car, is something that will be upon us probably before we might expect it. So um, that's really all I wanted to share with you today. I've left a little bit of time for questions. I think we've got around five minutes left. Um, so that's me. Thank you very much for listening and uh, happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Julie.